initially when I was diagnosed, they said that it was ocular. There's two types. There's generalized, which affects your body, and then ocular that affects your eyes. So I was initially diagnosed with ocular, and then it started to progress into a lot of other things. And I got frustrated because I just didn't understand how we went from my eyes to everything else. Mm -hmm. And so when I felt like the treatments just weren't doing what I needed them to do, I just stopped. Initially, that was not a problem. Initially, it seemed great. <laughs> but... And then it took a turn for the worse. Um, by 2017, um, let's say February, I started to show um, signs of a lot of generalized weakness. My arms were very weak. My throat muscles were weak. I couldn't chew properly anymore. I couldn't swallow food properly anymore. And I actually couldn't talk properly anymore. Yeah. And this is really interesting. That weakness, that muscle weakness, led to you not exhaling properly. Yeah. And you weren't getting rid of enough carbon dioxide. And so on December 8th, um, all that weakness, especially the weakness with my breathing muscles and stuff, led um, me to a health crisis called a myasthenia crisis. And that's basically when your respiratory muscles are affected and I went into respiratory failure. Which led to cardiac arrest. Arrest, yes. It was, it was an interesting ordeal. It happened at home and the first, um, the first symptoms, I guess, um, I wasn't speaking properly and all these things and my little brother was there and he noticed and he called my sister. And by the time they came, they called 911, they tried to keep me awake. By the time the paramedics got there, I was out. My heart had already stopped and they had to resuscitate me. And then of course it stopped two more times, once in the ambulance and then another once more in the emergency room. And You ended up in a coma, but you say God was in the coma. He sure was. He sure was. It was interesting because I was in a dark place. I didn't know where I was, but I just knew that something was wrong. Something was different. I was surrounded by darkness and it wasn't just darkness. It was like a void of light. And as I was there, I could see myself laying down and I saw myself almost like out of my body. So I could see myself. And as I was there, I could just see that there was this, there was two forces. One of them was a little bit lighter. The other one just seemed like pure darkness. And there was a tug of war and I was <laughs> in the middle, pulling me back, pulling me forth, pulling me back, pulling me forth. And it came to a certain point in time where I saw myself just lying down and I could tell that there was something wrong, but I could hear people talking. You heard the nurses, you oh, heard the people in your room. I heard room. everybody. I everybody, heard everybody take note yeah. if you're dealing with someone in a coma. Yeah, and it's very true because at a certain point in time, I think um, somebody had told my mom that I, I couldn't hear, so there was no point. She just needed to just be there. And I'm glad that she didn't listen because everything that the people said, I, I heard everything to the point that when I woke up from the coma, I recorded everything down, started writing everything I heard, all the promises people made me. I was like, listen, I'm I'm coming. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How did this resolve? Wow. Do you know the song, the refrain, darkness and light stood face to face, but mercy said no. Amen. Amen. Mercy did say no. Mercy did say no. Well, basically, um, that night, um, a lot of things weren't going well, and it just seemed, the doctors gave me less than 10 hours to live, actually. They had tried so many different things. My oxygen level was not going up. At that point, my heart was weak, my lungs were weak. You weren't expected to make it through the night. No, but um, my family and friends and my church family were actually in the waiting room, about 30 of them, actually. And when the doctors came, they said something along the lines of, you know, we don't think she's going to make it, so we're going to bring a social worker. You guys need to start thinking about funeral arrangements. And my pastor said, you know, thank you for everything, but we're going to pray. You do what you need to do, and we're just going to stay here and pray. And they prayed that night. They sent texts out, they called, and they did whatever they needed to do. And I tell you, within hours of their prayers, everything started to just turn right around. You believe that really was the key? Oh, yeah. Prayer. Oh, yeah. In fact, what did you say? That there was so much prayer going up for you that heaven had no, no choice, choice but to respond. No choice. You wakened with 14 intravenuses in yeah. you. You would have seven weeks in yeah. the hospital. Mm -hmm. The journey was not over. No. When I woke up from the coma, it now became a matter of um, healing. And that a doctor once told me that, you know, when you get sick, sometimes it can come immediately, but the healing takes time. And it was very true. There were some days where I got frustrated. There were some days where, you know, it would seem like we're getting good results and then it would just seem like things are recessing. But, you know, God being so good and God being so faithful, he didn't leave it there. He always made sure that he finished everything that he started. And I'm here today. What would you say? There are many watching, mm -hmm. don't we know? Whether it's an autoimmune disease or some other derailment and it's not a quick fix and That's discouragement not. is enemy territory. Yeah. They're in a hard waiting room. 
What encouragement would you give to them? Um, I'll start with one of my favorite Bible verses. It's Revelation 21.4. And it says, And one day God will wipe every tear away from your eye. There will be no more sickness, no more death, no more pain or sorrow. And that's something I held on to. It was a word God gave me very early on. And despite things not always going the way that I wanted, I always looked at my life and I always said, you know what, I'm here, I'm still alive, it could be worse. And so I used that to encourage myself. And I guess the encouragement that I would give to anybody else is when you're going through something, think of God as, let's say, the painter. He, he holds the brush and he paints. You only see the brush strokes, but he sees the big picture. And so when he gives you a word, you just have to trust that his picture is beautiful, even if it doesn't look that way to you, even if it looks abstract, you just release it to him. You let him finish what he needs to do because he will do it.